and that has practical consequences. As long as the natural life is in your body, it will do a lot towards repairing that body. Cut it, and up to a point it will heal, as a dead body would not. A live body is not one that never gets hurt, but one that can, to some extent, repair itself. In the same way, a Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man who is enabled to repent and pick himself up and begin over again after each stumble. Because the Christ life is inside him, repairing him all the time, enabling him to repeat, in some degree, the kind of voluntary death which Christ himself carried out. That is why the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. They hope, by being good, to please God if there is one, or if they think there is not, at least they hope to deserve approval from good men. But the Christian thinks any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us, just as the roof of a greenhouse does not attract the sun because it is bright, but becomes bright because the sun shines on it. And let me make it quite clear that when Christians say the Christ life is in them, they do not mean simply something mental or moral. When they speak of being in Christ or of Christ being in them, this is not simply a way of saying that they are thinking about Christ or copying him. They mean that Christ is actually operating through them, that the whole mass of Christians are the physical organism through which Christ acts, that we are his fingers and muscles, the cells of his body. And perhaps that explains one or two things. It explains why this new life is spread not only by purely mental acts like belief, but by bodily acts like baptism and holy communion. It is not merely the spreading of an idea, it is more like evolution, a biological or super-biological fact. There is no good trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That is why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. We may think this rather crude and unspiritual. God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. Here is another thing that used to puzzle me. Is it not frightfully unfair that this new life should be confined to people who have heard of Christ and been able to believe in him? But the truth is, God has not told us what his arrangements about the other people are. We do know that no man can be saved except through Christ. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. But in the meantime, if you are worried about the people outside, the most unreasonable thing you can do is to remain outside yourself. Christians are Christ's body, the organism through which he works. Every addition to that body enables him to do more. If you want to help those outside, you must add your own little cell to the body of Christ, who alone can help them. Cutting off a man's fingers would be an odd way of getting him to do more work. Another possible objection is this. Why is God landing in this enemy-occupied world in disguise and starting a sort of secret society to undermine the devil? Why is he not landing in force, invading it? Is it that he is not strong enough? Well, Christians think he is going to land in force. We do not know when. But we can guess why he is delaying. He wants to give us the chance of joining his side freely. I do not suppose you and I would have thought much of a Frenchman who waited till the Allies were marching into Germany and then announced he was on our side. God will invade. But I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. When the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade all right. But what is the good of saying you are on his side then, when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream, and something else, something it never entered your head to conceive, comes crashing in? Something so beautiful to some of us, and so terrible to others, that none of us will have any choice left. For this time it will be God without disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying you could choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. Book 3 Christian Behavior Chapter 1 The Three Parts of Morality 
There is a story about a schoolboy who was asked what he thought God was like. He replied that as far as he could make out, God was the sort of person who is always snooping round to see if anyone is enjoying himself and then trying to stop it. And I am afraid that is the sort of idea that the word morality raises in a good many people's minds. Something that interferes, something that stops you having a good time. In reality, moral rules are directions for running the human machine. Every moral rule is there to prevent a breakdown or a strain or a friction in the running of that machine. That is why these rules at first seem to be constantly interfering with our natural inclinations. When you are being taught how to use any machine, the instructor keeps on saying, No, don't do it like that. Because, of course, there are all sorts of things that look all right and seem to you the natural way of treating the machine, but do not really work. Some people prefer to talk about moral ideals rather than moral rules, and about moral idealism rather than moral obedience. Now it is, of course, quite true that moral perfection is an ideal in the sense that we cannot achieve it. In that sense, every kind of perfection is, for us humans, an ideal. We cannot succeed in being perfect car drivers or perfect tennis players or in drawing perfectly straight lines. But there is another sense in which it is very misleading to call moral perfection an ideal. When a man says that a certain woman or house or ship or garden is his ideal, he does not mean unless he is rather a fool, that everyone else ought to have the same ideal. In such matters we are entitled to have different tastes and, therefore, different ideals. But it is dangerous to describe a man who tries very hard to keep the moral law as a man of high ideals, because this might lead you to think that moral perfection was a private taste of his own, and that the rest of us were not called on to share it. This would be a disastrous mistake. Perfect behavior may be as unattainable as perfect gear-changing when we drive. But it is a necessary ideal prescribed for all men by the very nature of the human machine, just as perfect gear-changing is an ideal prescribed for all drivers by the very nature of cars. And it would be even more dangerous to think of oneself as a person of high ideals because one is trying to tell no lies at all, instead of only a few lies, or never to commit adultery, instead of committing it only seldom, or not to be a bully, instead of being only a moderate bully. It might lead you to become a prig and to think you are rather a special person who deserved to be congratulated on his idealism. In reality, you might just as well expect to be congratulated because whenever you do a sum, you try to get it quite right. Well, to be sure, perfect arithmetic is an ideal. You will certainly make some mistakes in some calculations. But there is nothing very fine about trying to be quite accurate at each step in each sum. It would be idiotic not to try for every mistake is going to cause you trouble later on. In the same way, every moral failure is going to cause trouble, probably to others and certainly to yourself. By talking about rules and obedience instead of ideals and idealism, we help to remind ourselves of these facts. Now let us go a step further. There are two ways in which the human machine goes wrong. One is when human individuals drift apart from one another or else collide with one another and do one another damage by cheating or bullying. The other is when things go wrong inside the individual, when the different parts of him, his different faculties and desires and so on, either drift apart or interfere with one another. You can get the idea plain if you think of us as a fleet of ships sailing in formation. The voyage will be a success only in the first place if the ships do not collide and get in one another's way and secondly, if each ship is seaworthy and has her engines in good order. As a matter of fact, you cannot have either of these two things without the other. If the ships keep on having collisions, they will not remain seaworthy very long. On the other hand, if their steering gears are out of order, they will not be able to avoid collisions. Or, if you like, think of humanity as a band playing a tune. To get a good result, you need two things. Each player's individual instrument must be in tune, and also each must come in at the right moment, so as to combine with all the others. But there is one thing we have not yet taken into account. We have not asked where the fleet is trying to get to, or what piece of music the band is trying to play. The instruments might all be in tune, and might all come in at the right moment, but even so the performance would not be a success if they had been engaged to provide dance music, and actually played nothing but dead marches. And however well the fleet sailed, its voyage would be a failure if it were meant to reach New York and actually arrived at Calcutta. Morality, then, seems to be concerned with three things. Firstly, with fair play and harmony between individuals. 
Secondly, with what might be called tidying up or harmonizing things inside each individual. Thirdly, with the general purpose of human life as a whole, what man was made for, what course the whole fleet ought to be on, what tune the conductor of the band wants it to play. You may have noticed that modern people are nearly always thinking about the first thing and forgetting the other two. When people say in the newspapers that we are striving for Christian moral standards, they usually mean that we are striving for kindness and fair play between nations and classes and individuals. That is, they are thinking only of the first thing. When a man says about something he wants to do, it can't be wrong because it doesn't do anyone else any harm, he is thinking only of the first thing. He is thinking it does not matter what his ship is like inside, provided that he does not run into the next ship. And it is quite natural, when we start thinking about morality, to begin with the first thing, with social relations. For one thing, the results of bad morality in that sphere are so obvious and press on us every day, war and poverty and graft and lies and shoddy work. And also, as long as you stick to the first thing, there is very little disagreement about morality. Almost all people at all times have agreed, in theory, that human beings ought to be honest and kind and helpful to one another. But though it is natural to begin with all that, if our thinking about morality stops there, we might just as well not have thought at all. Unless we go on to the second thing, the tidying up inside each human being, we are only deceiving ourselves. What is the good of telling the ships how to steer so as to avoid collisions if, in fact, they are such crazy old tubs that they cannot be steered at all? What is the good of drawing up on paper rules for social behavior if we know that, in fact, our greed, cowardice, ill-temper and self-conceit are going to prevent us from keeping them? I do not mean for a moment that we ought not to think and think hard about improvements in our social and economic system. What I do mean is that all that thinking will be mere moonshine unless we realize that nothing but the courage and unselfishness of individuals is ever going to make any system work properly. It is easy enough to remove the particular kinds of graft or bullying that go on under the present system. But as long as men are twisters or bullies, they will find some new way of carrying on the old game under the new system. You cannot make men good by law. And without good men, you cannot have a good society. That is why we must go on to think of the second thing, of morality inside the individual. But I do not think we can stop there either. We are now getting to the point at which different beliefs about the universe lead to different behavior. And it would seem, at first sight, very sensible to stop before we got there, and just carry on with those parts of morality that all sensible people agree about. But can we? Remember that religion involves a series of statements about facts, which must be either true or false. If they are true, one set of conclusions will follow about the right sailing of the human fleet. If they are false, quite a different set. For example, let us go back to the man who says that a thing cannot be wrong unless it hurts some other human being. He quite understands that he must not damage the other ships in the convoy, but he honestly thinks that what he does to his own ship is simply his own business. But does it not make a great difference whether his ship is his own property or not? Does it not make a great difference whether I am, so to speak, the landlord of my own mind and body, or only a tenant responsible to the real landlord? If somebody else made me for his own purposes, then I shall have a lot of duties which I should not have if I simply belong to myself. Again, Christianity asserts that every individual human being is going to live forever, and this must be either true or false. Now, there are a good many things which would not be worth bothering about if I were going to live only seventy years, but which I had better bother about very seriously if I am going to live forever. Perhaps my bad temper or my jealousy are gradually getting worse, so gradually that the increase in seventy years will not be very noticeable. But it might be absolute hell in a million years. In fact, if Christianity is true, hell is the precisely correct technical term for what it would be. And immortality makes this other difference, which, by the by, has a connection with the difference between totalitarianism and democracy. If individuals live only seventy years, then a state or a nation or a civilization which may last for a thousand years is more important than an individual. But if Christianity is true, then the individual is not only more important, but incomparably more important, for he is everlasting, and the life of a state or a civilization compared with his is only a moment. It seems then that if we are to think about morality, we must think of all three departments, relations between man and man, 
things inside each man, and relations between man and the power that made him. We can all cooperate in the first one. Disagreements begin with the second and become serious with the third. It is in dealing with the third that the main differences between Christian and non-Christian morality come out. For the rest of this book, I am going to assume the Christian point of view and look at the whole picture as it will be if Christianity is true. Chapter 2 The Cardinal Virtues The previous section was originally composed to be given as a short talk on the air. If you are allowed to talk for only ten minutes, pretty well everything else has to be sacrificed to brevity. One of my chief reasons for dividing morality up into three parts, with my picture of the ship sailing in convoy, was that this seemed the shortest way of covering the ground. Here I want to give some idea of another way in which the subject has been divided by old writers, which was too long to use in my talk, but which is a very good one. According to this longer scheme there are seven virtues. Four of them are called cardinal virtues, and the remaining three are called theological virtues. The cardinal ones are those which all civilized people recognize. The theological are those which, as a rule, only Christians know about. I shall deal with the theological ones later on. At present I am talking about the four cardinal virtues. The word cardinal has nothing to do with cardinals in the Roman Church. It comes from a Latin word meaning the hinge of a door. These were called cardinal virtues because they are, as we should say, pivotal. They are prudence, temperance, justice and fortitude. Prudence means practical common sense, taking the trouble to think out what you are doing and what is likely to come of it. Nowadays most people hardly think of prudence as one of the virtues. In fact, because Christ said we could only get into his world by being like children, many Christians have the idea that, provided you are good, it does not matter being a fool. But that is a misunderstanding. In the first place, most children show plenty of prudence about doing the things they are really interested in and think them out quite sensibly. In the second place, as St. Paul points out, Christ never meant that we were to remain children in intelligence. On the contrary, he told us to be not only as harmless as doves, but also as wise as serpents. He wants a child's heart, but a grown-up's head. He wants us to be simple, single-minded, affectionate and teachable, as good children are. But he also wants every bit of intelligence we have to be alert at its job and in first-class fighting trim. The fact that you are giving money to a charity does not mean that you need not try to find out whether that charity is a fraud or not. The fact that what you are thinking about is God himself, for example, when you are praying, does not mean that you can be content with the same babyish ideas which you had when you were a five-year-old. It is, of course, quite true that God will not love you any the less or have less use for you if you happen to have been born with a very second-rate brain. He has room for people with very little sense, but he wants everyone to use what sense they have. The proper motto is not, Be good, sweet maid, and let who can be clever, but, Be good, sweet maid, and don't forget that this involves being as clever as you can. God is no fonder of intellectual slackers than of any other slackers. If you are thinking of becoming a Christian, I warn you, you are embarking on something which is going to take the whole of you, brains and all. But fortunately it works the other way round. Anyone who is honestly trying to be a Christian will soon find his intelligence being sharpened. One of the reasons why it needs no special education to be a Christian is that Christianity is an education itself. That is why an uneducated believer like Bunyan was able to write a book that has astonished the whole world. Temperance is, unfortunately, one of those words that has changed its meaning. It now usually means teetotalism. But in the days when the second cardinal virtue was christened temperance, it meant nothing of the sort. Temperance referred not specially to drink, but to all pleasures. And it meant not abstaining, but going the right length and no further. It is a mistake to think that Christians ought all to be teetotalers. Mohammedanism, not Christianity, is the teetotal religion. Of course, it may be the duty of a particular Christian or of any Christian at a particular time to abstain from strong drink, either because he is the sort of man who cannot drink at all without drinking too much, or because he wants to give the money to the poor, or because he is with people who are inclined to drunkenness and must not encourage them by drinking himself. But the whole point is that he is abstaining, for a good reason, from something which he does not condemn and which he likes to see other people enjoying. 
One of the marks of a certain type of bad man is that he cannot give up a thing himself without wanting everyone else to give it up. That is not the Christian way. An individual Christian may see fit to give up all sorts of things for special reasons, marriage, or meat, or beer, or the cinema. But the moment he starts saying the things are bad in themselves, or looking down his nose at other people who do use them, he has taken the wrong turning. One great piece of mischief has been done by the modern restriction of the word temperance to the question of drink. It helps people to forget that you can be just as intemperate about lots of other things. A man who makes his golf or his motor bicycle the center of his life, or a woman who devotes all her thoughts to clothes or bridge or her dog, is being just as intemperate as someone who gets drunk every evening. Of course, it does not show on the outside so easily. Bridge mania or golf mania do not make you fall down in the middle of the road. But God is not deceived by externals. Justice means much more than the sort of thing that goes on in law courts. It is the old name for everything we should now call fairness. It includes honesty, give and take, truthfulness, keeping promises, and all that side of life. And fortitude includes both kinds of courage, the kind that faces danger as well as the kind that sticks it under pain. Guts is perhaps the nearest modern English. You will notice, of course, that you cannot practice any of the other virtues very long without bringing this one into play. There is one further point about the virtues that ought to be noticed. There is a difference between doing some particular just or temperate action and being a just or temperate man. Someone who is not a good tennis player may now and then make a good shot. What you mean by a good player is the man whose eye and muscles and nerves have been so trained by making innumerable good shots that they can now be relied on. They have a certain tone or quality which is there even when he is not playing, just as a mathematician's mind has a certain habit and outlook which is there even when he is not doing mathematics. In the same way, a man who perseveres in doing just actions gets in the end a certain quality of character. Now it is that quality rather than the particular actions which we mean when we talk of virtue. This distinction is important for the following reason. If we thought only of the particular actions, we might encourage three wrong ideas. One, we might think that, provided you did the right thing, it did not matter how or why you did it whether you did it willingly or unwillingly, sulkily or cheerfully, through fear of public opinion or for its own sake. But the truth is that right actions done for the wrong reason do not help to build the internal quality or character called a virtue. And it is this quality or character that really matters. If the bad tennis player hits very hard, not because he sees that a very hard stroke is required, but because he has lost his temper, his stroke might possibly, by luck, help him to win that particular game but it will not be helping him to become a reliable player. Two, we might think that God wanted simply obedience to a set of rules, whereas he really wants people of a particular sort. Three, we might think that the virtues were necessary only for this present life, that in the other world we could stop being just because there is nothing to quarrel about, and stop being brave because there is no danger. Now it is quite true that there will probably be no occasion for just or courageous acts in the next world, but there will be every occasion for being the sort of people that we can become only as the result of doing such acts here. The point is not that God will refuse you admission to his eternal world if you have not got certain qualities of character. The point is that if people have not got at least the beginnings of those qualities inside them, then no possible external conditions could make a heaven for them. That is, could make them happy within the deep, strong, unshakable kind of happiness God intends for us. Chapter 3 Social Morality The first thing to get clear about Christian morality between man and man is that in this department Christ did not come to preach any brand new morality. The golden rule of the New Testament, do as you would be done by, is a summing up of what everyone at bottom had always known to be right. Really great moral teachers never do introduce new moralities. It is quacks and cranks who do that. As Dr. Johnson said, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. The real job of every moral teacher is to keep on bringing us back time after time to the old simple principles which we are all so anxious not to see. Like bringing a horse back and back to the fence it has refused to jump, or bringing a child back and back to the bit in its lesson that it wants to shirk. 
The second thing to get clear is that Christianity has not and does not profess to have a detailed political program for applying do as you would be done by to a particular society at a particular moment. It could not have. It is meant for all men at all times, and the particular program which suited one place or time would not suit another. And anyhow, that is not how Christianity works. When it tells you to feed the hungry, it does not give you lessons in cookery. When it tells you to read the scriptures, it does not give you lessons in Hebrew and Greek, or even in English grammar. It was never intended to replace or supersede the ordinary human arts and sciences. It is rather a director which will set them all to the right jobs, and a source of energy which will give them all new life, if only they will put themselves at its disposal. People say, the church ought to give us a lead. That is true if they mean it in the right way, but false if they mean it in the wrong way. By the church, they ought to mean the whole body of practicing Christians. And when they say that the church should give us a lead, they ought to mean that some Christians, those who happen to have the right talents, should be economists and statesmen, and that all economists and statesmen should be Christians, and that their whole efforts in politics and economics should be directed to putting do as you would be done by into action. If that happened, and if we others were really ready to take it, then we should find the Christian solution for our own social problems pretty quickly. But, of course, when they ask for a lead from the church, most people mean they want the clergy to put out a political program. That is silly. The clergy are those particular people within the whole church who have been specially trained and set aside to look after what concerns us as creatures who are going to live forever, and we are asking them to do a quite different job for which they have not been trained. The job is really on us, on the layman. The application of Christian principles, say to trade unionism or education, must come from Christian trade unionists and Christian schoolmasters, just as Christian literature comes from Christian novelists and dramatists, not from the bench of bishops getting together and trying to write plays and novels in their spare time. All the same, the New Testament, without going into details, gives us a pretty clear hint of what a fully Christian society would be like. Perhaps it gives us more than we can take. It tells us that there are to be no passengers or parasites. If a man does not work, he ought not to eat. Everyone is to work with his own hands, and, what is more, everyone's work is to produce something good. There will be no manufacture of silly luxuries and then of sillier advertisements to persuade us to buy them. And there is to be no swank or side, no putting on airs. To that extent, a Christian society would be what we now call leftist. On the other hand, it is always insisting on obedience, obedience and outward marks of respect from all of us to properly appointed magistrates, from children to parents, and, I am afraid this is going to be very unpopular, from wives to husbands. Thirdly, it is to be a cheerful society, full of singing and rejoicing and regarding worry or anxiety as wrong. Courtesy is one of the Christian virtues, and the New Testament hates what it calls busybodies. If there were such a society in existence, and you or I visited it, I think we should come away with a curious impression. We should feel that its economic life was very socialistic and, in that sense, advanced, but that its family life and its code of manners were rather old-fashioned, perhaps even ceremonious and aristocratic. Each of us would like some bits of it, but I'm afraid very few of us would like the whole thing. That is just what one would expect if Christianity is the total plan for the human machine. We have all departed from that total plan in different ways, and each of us wants to make out that his own modification of the original plan is the plan itself. You will find this again and again about anything that is really Christian. Everyone is attracted by bits of it and wants to pick out those bits and leave the rest. That is why we do not get much further, and that is why people who are fighting for quite opposite things can both say they are fighting for Christianity. Now another point. There is one bit of advice given to us by the ancient heathen Greeks and by the Jews in the Old Testament and by the great Christian teachers of the Middle Ages which the modern economic system has completely disobeyed. All these people told us not to lend money at interest and lending money at interest, what we call investment, is the basis of our whole system. Now it may not absolutely follow that we are wrong. Some people say that when Moses and Aristotle and the Christians agreed in forbidding interest, or usury as they called it, they could not foresee the joint stock company, and were only thinking of the private money lender, and that, therefore, we need not bother about what they said. 
That is a question I cannot decide on. I am not an economist, and I simply do not know whether the investment system is responsible for the state we are in or not. This is where we want the Christian economist. But I should not have been honest if I had not told you that three great civilizations had agreed, or so it seems at first sight, in condemning the very thing on which we have based our whole life. One more point and I am done. In the passage where the New Testament says that everyone must work, it gives as a reason, in order that he may have something to give to those in need. Charity, giving to the poor, is an essential part of Christian morality. In the frightening parable of the sheep and the goats, it seems to be the point on which everything turns. Some people nowadays say that charity ought to be unnecessary, and that instead of giving to the poor, we ought to be producing a society in which there were no poor to give to. They may be quite right in saying that we ought to produce that kind of society. But if anyone thinks that, as a consequence, you can stop giving in the meantime, then he has parted company with all Christian morality. I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. I am speaking now of charities in the common way. Particular cases of distress among your own relatives, friends, neighbours or employees, which God, as it were, forces upon your notice, may demand much more, even to the crippling and endangering of your own position. For many of us, the great obstacle to charity lies not in our luxurious living or desire for more money, but in our fear, fear of insecurity. This must often be recognized as a temptation. Sometimes our pride also hinders our charity. We are tempted to spend more than we ought on the showy forms of generosity, tipping, hospitality, and less than we ought on those who really need our help. And now, before I end, I am going to venture on a guess as to how this section has affected any who have read it. My guess is that there are some leftist people among them who are very angry that it has not gone further in that direction, and some people of an opposite sort who are angry because they think it has gone much too far. If so, that brings us right up against the real snag in all this drawing up of blueprints for a Christian society. Most of us are not really approaching the subject in order to find out what Christianity says, we are approaching it in the hope of finding support from Christianity for the views of our own party. We are looking for an ally where we are offered either a master or a judge. I am just the same. There are bits in this section that I wanted to leave out. And that is why nothing whatever is going to come of such talks unless we go a much longer way round. A Christian society is not going to arrive until most of us really want it. And we are not going to want it until we become fully Christian. I may repeat, do as you would be done by, till I am black in the face, but I cannot really carry it out till I love my neighbor as myself. And I cannot learn to love my neighbor as myself till I learn to love God. And I cannot learn to love God except by learning to obey Him. And so, as I warned you, we are driven on to something more inward, driven on from social matters to religious matters, for the longest way round is the shortest way home. Chapter 4 Morality and Psychoanalysis I have said that we should never get a Christian society unless most of us became Christian individuals. That does not mean, of course, that we can put off doing anything about society until some imaginary date in the far future. It means that we must begin both jobs at once. One, the job of seeing how do as you would be done by can be applied in detail to modern society, and two, the job of becoming the sort of people who really would apply it if we saw how. I now want to begin considering what the Christian idea of a good man is, the Christian specification for the human machine. Before I come down to details, there are two more general points I should like to make. First of all, since Christian morality claims to be a technique for putting the human machine right, I think you would like to know how it is related to another technique which seems to make a similar claim, namely psychoanalysis. Now you want to distinguish very clearly between two things, between the actual medical theories and technique of the psychoanalysts and the general philosophical view of the world which Freud and some others have gone on to add to this. 
The second thing, the philosophy of Freud, is in direct contradiction to Christianity and also in direct contradiction to the other great psychologist, Jung. And furthermore, when Freud is talking about how to cure neurotics, he is speaking